So as we enter the East, we are feeling good. We're on the Eastern Shield in our, the last of our four stops on this series. And if you're just joining us, this is the Four Shields of hu a Sacred Human Initiation. This is the, the human mandala of divinity and humanity, the wholeness of who we are. And so we've had stops all along the way in the South, the child, the body, the, the, you know, coming into the world, and then the adolescent in the West, the place where the sun sets, you know, the time when we go more inward, and it's more about our emotions and our soul and our psyche and discovering who we are. And we come out in the North as the adult, as the initiated adult who has a sense of who they are and what they have to give. There's a sense of, you know, where is home and what are my gifts and who are my people, and we give that. And then uh, Shari, Sherry asked me yesterday, what's, what's this week? And I said, it's, it's light, it's the East. She goes, oh, that's the best one. <laughs> and so it is, so it is really, because the divinity, the spirit that is the East is what underpins and infills all aspects of being, isn't it? So, it, you know, as in the story of Martha and Mary, remember, Martha was busy getting everything ready when Jesus was coming over and, and others were gathering at her home and she was cleaning and she was cooking and there was all kinds of frenzied energy. You know, she was just, she was stressed and she was distracted. And, and Mary, her sister, is sitting at Jesus' feet, meanwhile. And she says to Jesus, tell her to help me. <laughs> And, and he says, oh, Martha, you're so busy and worried about so many things. You're so distracted. Mary has chosen the better part. And so it's not that the North doesn't matter. It's not that the North isn't important, that our service and our gifts and our preparations and our organization and our desire to give the best isn't important. But underpinning that, the better part it's the spirit of it all, the divine that is infused in all these different aspects of being, right? We always must come back to that. Well, we don't have to, but life would be a lot easier if we do, right? So when we do feel that sense of stress or too much going on or I'm too busy, you know, there's such a, a little bit of an odor, overdeveloped north going on, right? So it's either time for a little southern play, a little childlike play, or maybe it's time to just... Ah, let's just pause, let's reset with prayer and meditation and come back to the truth of who we are. So the Eastern shield is obviously the shield of spirit. It's also the element of light and even fire. It's also springtime. And so in the seasons of the soul, the seasons of our beingness and our wholeness, it is springtime. You know, it's like when Persephone comes up from Hades and she walks across the earth and the flowers bloom with every step, right? This is the kind of joy that can come from the East, the kind of deep peace that is available to us in the East. It's sunrise, it's the dawning of light in the East. So you know how that first light comes and then it, the, when the sun just gradually begins to rise, there's sometimes beautiful colors in the sky, but there's also a casting of light upon the earth and everything starts to come clear. We can see more clearly, everything becomes beautiful in that light. And so that too is a part of our uh, understanding ourselves as the divine and one with this light, that we too sort of brighten and arise like the sun, and things become clearer in our lives and in our world because we begin to see in that way. The East is a place where we gain vision and wisdom, where we bring that kind of wise visionary energy to the world. You know how a plant is, how it strains for the light if it's in too much darkness or too much shade. And trees, if they're on top of one another or too close, the branches will reach around, right, to get the light. And they'll grow in all these kinds of weird ways, just, just trying to get to the light. And so we too have that natural propensity. All of life has that natural propensity to reach toward the light. And so the East is a natural place for us to want to be. And so it's a little bit 
when we've gone all the way around the wheel, there's not so much trepidation of walking through the doorway into the east, like there might have been in the west, you know, to go into that darker, deeper space of introspection. In the east, it's more like, oh, yeah, the light. <laughs> you know, there's kind of a, a natural draw there for most of us. If we have um, an an underdeveloped Eastern side, because all of these shields also are kind of an assessment for us, an understanding of, you know, oh, wow, I'm spending all my time in the North, and so I'm, you know, maybe serving and working all the time, and, I, and I, it's a little bit overdone, or I'm spending so much time in the West that, you know, I'm in the sort of the drama of emotionality and not seeming to be able to break through out into the light. And so that, that's where we can be hanging out in one shield a little bit too long, right? Or if we're too much in the child, we just don't grow up. We don't ever initiate ourselves as responsible adults through the West. So in the, in the East, then, there is this, um, actually, a, an underdeveloped, can be an underdeveloped Eastern shield, can be one who just doesn't really pay that much attention to spirit, God, energy, divine, doesn't believe in it, maybe. Um, so there's just, you know, it's a very mind kind of approach, a very intellectual kind of approach. Remember, the north is the mind. And so maybe a more intellectual approach to life. You know, you've met people who say, this is all there is, you know? So it's this life and then dust to dust and it's all over. To which my heart always goes, oh, <laughs> I know there's more than this. So, um, and that it's infused right here and right now. So an underdeveloped um, East might be one that doesn't believe or hasn't in anything that's of the divine or the spirit or doesn't practice at all anything that brings us into that, that real conscious connection with spirit. So no sense of, of prayer or alignment or even this idea of co-creation. So all of that is kind of lost if we don't have a familiarity with the East. And then if we are overdeveloped in the East, well, we can be pretty airy-fairy, pretty woo-woo, not very grounded, right? <laughs> and you may have had little passes with that, or maybe you spent a lot of time hanging out in the East, you know? Um, when I went to India, I noticed that a lot of the Babas were standing on one leg like this for like really, really long periods of time. And I inquired about it, I noticed some of their legs were withered, and, and that was the point was that the, you know, was all about the East. It was all about spirit. So the continuation of standing on one leg would actually wither away the body itself because the body was dust to dust, right? It's all about spirit. And so if it's pure spirituality, then there is really no honoring of the body as a temple. And so we miss sort of the, the wholeness that is offered to us, right? And so if we're in the East all the time, we kind of flit from one thing to the other. And there's, have you ever heard the, the saying, you're so um, heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good? <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what this wheel offers us. It says, you know, yeah, we can say the East is, wow, this is the best one. We love this one because we are on the spiritual path and we know how when we are grounded in spirit, when we are centered in spirit, how all things flow from there. But we also know that we have a body that needs to be taken care of and that is a great gift to us and that we have a place for play in our life and for service in our life and relationship in our lives. So today's mystic isn't so cloistered anymore, right? Today's mystic is you right out here in the marketplace, you who is having that direct experience with spirit, with God, which is the definition of the mystic, that direct experience. So we can still then, though, be in the East and, and still be living under a concept or a shroud that is kind of blanketing um, the idea of the East that, that there's still we can bring that kind of not enough thinking in. Did you ever hear of the desert mothers and fathers? The desert mothers and fathers were early mystics, early Christian mystics who took to the desert rather than be part of the Orthodox Church and the, the you know rituals and things that were a part of that doctrine that was a part of the church They said I want a direct experience with the divine and so they went out into the desert and some of the desert mothers and fathers were on their own in complete solitude but others began to form monastic and and convent like communities and So even though they were out in nature, they still had a sense of community with each other 
And so it was with Father Lot and Abbot Joseph. And there's a story from the sayings of the Desert Fathers where uh, Father Lot came to the elder and wiser Abbot Joseph and he said, you know, Father, I, I keep my, my little prayers to the limit of my ability, and I keep my meditation to the limit of my ability, and I, I keep the contemplative silence to the limit of my ability, and I search my heart for thoughts that must be cleansed so that my heart can stay open and cleansed to the limit of my ability. But what more shall I do, Abba Joseph? And so we can see that there is a lot of limit in the thinking of Father Lot. And Father Joseph has no such thing because his response is to rise up and to put his hands up toward the heavens. And it is said that every one of his fingers became a fiery lamp. And he said, why not be transformed then into fire? little different perspective, isn't it? <laughs> so we can dabble in the East. You know, we can say our little prayers to the limit of our little ability <laughs> and believe that there is great limitation. Or we can be like Father Abbott who gets it, that you can completely merge with the truth of who you are, with the divinity that you are, be raised up by it, and walk through it like with no fear, like the phoenix rising from the ashes. He knows there is rebirth because somebody who is a friend of the East understands death and rebirth, understands that where there is death, another door is opening to new life. This is the transition time of the East. We become elders in the North, but we transition in the East. We have our life transition and we come reborn again. But that's just a metaphor for all the times that we get reborn in a lifetime if we continue to work the wheel of life. So over and over, like Paul said, I die daily. Every day we can say, you know, I let go of whatever it is that might stand in my way and, and that image of Father Abbott might come to our minds and we might stand up really tall and stretch out our fingers and imagine that they're lamps, they're fire because we can be merged with the truth of God as fire and feel that fire and know and have no fear that whatever dross needs to be burned away will be burned away and that the truth and the light of who we are will stand tall. It's a very different perspective than saying this flesh is not worthy, this flesh is less than. It's a very different perspective than to just say, I give it all. It's that surrender piece in the East that some of us get, there, there's some of the trepidation that comes right in the East. I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it over. Some of you have, uh, and there was reference today to Jack Schaefer's memorial yesterday. And I had the, even though I didn't get to know Jack well, it was a really deep privilege as it always is to be with you in these times of prayer. And, um, and to notice the difference from one time when I prayed with Jack to another and the shift that happened. You know, at one time, it was a longing for life to continue, you know, a sense of engagement still in life. The second time, or the last time I prayed with him, was a sense of surrender. And so that doorway had been passed through. That place of surrender had been passed through. And so even when we're not making our life transition, of course, we are asked again and again. We come to that place of we're gripping, right? And it's time to... Just let go, surrender, and trust, and faith. They all belong to the East. Sure as the sun rises every day, and we don't have to drum it up or dance it up. We can in celebration, but it's not contingent on our drumming or our dancing or our singing it up or our chanting it up. It's going to rise anyway. And so it's that knowing that our reverent practices are reverent practices, but there's something that we can trust, that death and rebirth cycle will happen again and again and again. So in a way, we become visionaries when we come into the light again of the East. You know, we come with a, a new kind of wisdom. 
So if we learn to love ourselves in the West, we learn to love our neighbors in the North, we learn to love God with all our heart, our mind, and our soul in the East, including, of course, everything, including our neighbors and ourselves. So it's a real holistic kind of universal place that we come to. When we've gone around the wheel, you know, we come back with a kind of spiritual maturity that we didn't have before. So remember, we are Adam and Eve who are banished from the garden. And a few weeks ago, I told that story of Adam and Eve when they were banished from the garden. And, and they were banished because Eve had that innate desire in her, that wisdom within her that said, y you, there's more. And so she reached for that, that fruit of the tree of knowledge so that she could see like God sees both good and evil. In fact, it's even said in the scriptures that, oh, now they can see like us both good and evil, us, the many faces of God, spoke as a plural, interestingly enough. And so then Adam and Eve are banished from the garden and banished basically to go around the wheel, you know? They left children of God. They came back co-creators with spirit. It's a very different distinction, isn't it? And so as children of God, sure, there is a sense of, of comfort and protection and a sense that we are a part of or at least related to this God. But it's a very different kind of relationship when we move through and we become, again, like that abbot in the desert. <laughs> it gets the idea that the fire, the spark that we call in, in unity, we say sometimes that we have a spark of divinity within us. And it's a good thing we say that at the beginning when we're first introduced to the principles, because if we said, you know, you, you are the full bonfire of divinity, it might really scare people off, right? Because <laughs> it can be hard enough to, to sort of take in the idea that I even have a spark of divinity, that I have this purity, this purity of love and, and, and light, and that I am divine in my essence. So a spark is helpful because sometimes we also have a hard time seeing it in others, people who do things in the world that seem cruel. We always get you know, kind of stuck on that conversation. Well, how can that person be divine? Well, just imagine they have a tiny little spark somewhere in there, right? And they've just lost sight of it. And so the darkness have fallen. And how do we get it back? Jesus gives us the way. He talks about the third eye. He says... The eye, he doesn't say the eyes, but the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye be sound, then your whole body will be filled with light. And if your eye is not sound, then your whole body will be filled with darkness. And so he reminds us that it's here with the spiritual eye that we see. Yes, as we get older, our eyes, our energy goes more into our eyes, you know. And then when people really are practicing their spirituality, you can see that kind of crystal energy in their eyes often. So, that, so it is physical eyes too, but he's really talking about that third eye, that spiritual eye, and seeing through that eye is the eyes of the East that see like God sees, able to see good and evil and not go running, you know? Able to see difficult things and not turn away, but see as God sees through that difficult thing to know that there is life and light and rebirth and joy and peace even through that obstacle. So when we see that, when we see the divinity in one another, when we see our friend in the hospital bed all hooked up to all kinds of stuff, it's, yes, our eyes see that, and we, see, we feel for our friend who might be having some pain right now. But when we see with the spiritual eye the light that Jesus is, can, is asking us to light, that lamp he's asking us to go to, and to see with that, then our whole being is filled with light, and we come to our friend as a light being, not a, oh, you poor thing being. Very different energy, right? So when we have gone round the wheel like Adam and Eve, we come back to that place from which we were banished, and now we don't have a fear of that big flaming sword that was put in the doorway, but we actually are, are so grounded in our wisdom now that we just pick up that sword because we understand it to be a saber of light. We understand it to be a, a discerner of things. That sword cuts the chafe from the wheat and allows the nourishing wheat to flourish. It cuts the ego away from the divine. 
yes, we need the ego, but it, it's not supposed to rule. And so it like calms things down. It takes the dross out. And then the best of the best is left. So when we, we are the bringers and the holders of that sword of truth and we enter the Garden of Eden again, we enter as completely different beings, no longer children but co-creators, with a vision from the third eye that sees in a whole different way the good and the evil and looks unafraid and moves through and serves from that place of courage and compassion, complete heart, and sees with truth through any circumstances to the truth. That's what we are called to do. Can you do that? Can you do it? Mario can. <laughs> you can. I know you can. And will you? Will you take yourself out into the world this day and this week and on into eternity and know that at any moment you can just bring your attention here? Ah, that's right. I can see from the big picture. I can see with an eagle eye view. I can see as God sees. And I won't look away because I know it is in my seeing and my light and my love and my courage that the world is healed and that my life works in a prosperous flow, and it is easy to give, and it is easy to receive, because I live and have my being and move in the spirit. That's what the East offers us. That is the gift of the East. Don't be a stranger to the East. We need that Eastern energy, and yet don't hang out there so much that you forget you have a body temple. You have a child within you that longs to play. You have a being, a deep being inside of you, a soul and a psyche that needs exploration and a sense of what are my gifts? What is it that through this channel that I have to offer the world? Who are my people? Where is my home? Those questions are worth asking in the so in the East, we become these wise visionaries when we return through the initiations of all these doorways. And then we come and we see, like Jesus told us so many times when the disciples ask and the people ask, where is the kingdom? When is the kingdom coming? How is the kingdom? What does the kingdom look like? And Jesus goes, wow, don't you see? Can't you see with this eye that it's here and it's now and it's everywhere present? I'm asking you, I'm telling you, I'm teaching you, I'm giving you parables and healings and over and over again. You can feel his frustration in his short three years of ministry to say, look, open, see, it's here. The kingdom of God is spread upon the earth. And men, and I know he meant women too, don't see it. <laughs> But if we look, we will. And that's our work. It's to pull the light forth, to pull the love forth, to pull the truth forth, to wield that sword of discernment that knows this is of the truth. This is not needed. This is of the truth. And, and to bring that kind of wisdom and light to the world to get a better idea of how these different shields work. If there is a ball laying in the yard, the southern shield will say, oh, something to play with, the child. And the, in the West, we'll see, the adolescent will see, oh, look, the ball has, the air is going out of the ball. It's deflating. And the Northern one will see the ball and say, oh, that needs to be put away. <laughs> and the Eastern shield will see the ball and say, a vision for the earth, you know? Very different perspective, isn't it? Yeah. But I know we all love the East. We all love the light. And so it is ours to decide how we are called into it. You know, one of the ways besides our practice that we can practice being in the East is reminding ourselves the experience, again, the mystical direct experience of, of the divine identity. So when we put ourselves in the seat of the witness and witness our thoughts, then we recognize who's watching the thoughts. Huh, I thought I was those thoughts. I thought I was the thinker. I thought I was the intelligence of my brain. And it turns out I'm watching the thoughts. So who am I then? 
Right? So the more we do that, the more we identify instead with the witness, the divine, the big picture, the more we become fully merged with what it is that we are in the East, the light, the love, the truth, the divine, the co-creator. And the more we see like God sees because we have been initiated into that, we have been given that, given that great gift from the first reach of Eve and given that through our initiation our banishment, it turns out, was a great gift. Thank you, God. God said, run along now, children, and go find out who you are. <laughs> Come back when you know. And so here we are at the eastern gate, knowing, entering, walking through the door. <sighs> it's good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Also in the East, one thing we might come along and, and interact with is the trickster. Yeah, the ego can be the trickster, right? The trickster of our mind that really that's what Father Lot was dealing with, was a trickster who was saying, I have a limit to my ability. I don't, you know, I've tried all these different things every which way and I can't seem to get there. Can you help me? It's like, oh, you've been dancing with the trickster. You know, in Native American medicine, it might be considered the coyote or the raven. In Christianity, it would be the serpent. It's the serpent who tempted Eve, right, for the fall. But now we realize, oh, the fall, after all, wasn't such a bad thing because we then developed into our spiritual ripeness and our maturity. But the serpent knew that, and the serpent said, you know, it's okay, eat of the fruit, you know? The serpent knew what, what God said, if, if you eat of it, you will die. It's okay, it turns out. It's okay to die, it turns out, because then we, we are reborn. So, so don't be afraid of the trickster as it shows up in its many forms. And the trickster might show up as, wow, I thought I had that all together and now the other shoe dropped, you know? <laughs> or it's a, sometimes in circles we'll say, you know, when the energy moves in counterclockwise direction, coyote is present, you know, there's a mixing it up a little bit. And it doesn't feel quite like what we're used to. The flow isn't happening just so. You know how it is when your whole life feels like it's like clicking along. You ever have those moments? It's just like, wow, everything's together. I'm feeling good. My health is great. Relationships are strong. I'm having fun. I'm out in the community. I'm serving, feeling a great sense of purpose. And then it seems like something goes, right? Something happens in that whole realm. You know, something's goes rocky in your relationship or you get some diagnosis of something and, and it's like, ah, oh, just when everything was clicking along, right? Zorba the Greek said, life is the whole catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> and so just embracing that and knowing that, that ah, the trickster is present. And what does that mean? <laughs> Indeed it is. <laughs> All right, Link. <laughs> He's got a lot of coyote blood, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was great, wasn't it? Spirit's totally in charge, for sure. <laughs> so we just, yeah, the laughter is so good, isn't it? And that's really, that's the antidote. That's the antidote when things don't work well. Give it, give it some gratitude and some laughter and some joy. You know, sometimes it just becomes absurd, right? Some days are just like this comedy of errors over and over again, and you just gotta go, all right, this is an interesting day. Thank you to the trickster, so. Well, here we are in this Eastern shield. We are wise visionaries in truth. We see God everywhere. We've been round the wheel. We have that maturity. And it's not a one-time spin, by the way. <laughs> so over and over again, we go round and round the wheel, across the wheel. We, we notice where we are maybe feeling a little bit out of balance, and we reach for the gifts of, of what that other shield can offer us. And so always this Eastern one, though, can really ground us in this yeah, acceptance of death and rebirth and so on and light and wisdom. So I want to close out with a prayer or poem by Adrian Rich that just encourages us to continue to go through the doorways, continue to move 
from one phase to the next, to move through one transition into the next, because it is a movement toward our wholeness and our spiritual maturation. And so here goes Adrian Rich. Either you will go through this door or you will not go through. If you go through, there's always the risk of remembering your name. Things look at you doubly. And you must look back and let them happen. If you do not go through, it is possible to live worthily, to maintain your attitudes, to hold your position, and even to die bravely. But much will blind you. Much will evade you. At what cost? Who knows? The door itself makes no promises. It's only a door. The Eastern door. If you go through, you will arise to your full divinity. And so let's know that, affirming that together as we close this series and fully enter the East. Together, I arise into the fullness of my divinity. And so it is. Thank you.